Genesis chapter number 18 tonight, if you will. Genesis chapter number 18. I kept watching the weather reports. And they said 70% chance of rain. We found a 60% chance of rain at the church. Went home and asked Linda, I said, what did you do with the rain? But I am so thankful God has blessed us with such a lovely day. Isn't it wonderful? Have you, have you just written and noticed how everything is just in bloom? Pollen is on the way. And uh, it's wonderful to see a new beginning, a fresh spring. Aren't you glad that after death, comes life. It's a Bible principle. Did you know that? Christ died that we might live. Amen? So life follows death, the winter time, the dead season, and to know that God is in control. You say, preacher, you're, you're talking. I know. I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm just taxiing down the runway. I'm in a holding pattern on the tarmac trying to get the engine revved up to where we can take off. How many of you feel like sometimes you wear many hats? Feel like you wear many hats? How many of you think you probably wear at least 10 different hats? Raise your hand. I wear the hat of a, of a son a husband, a dad, a granddad, a brother, a nephew, an uncle, a cousin, a Christian, a preacher, a pastor, sometime pianist, sometime song leader. A lot of hats. I didn't count them up, but I think that went over 10. How many? 14. I'm sure there's another one somewhere I could find. Oh, uh, con construction engineer. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, legal assistant. Uh, an electrical novice. Somebody say amen right there. Uh, I'll never forget. Never forget one of the first things I did after we came here. I was we painted and I changed out uh, a light switch going into the kitchen downstairs. And uh, I've always been used to changing them where they had plastic, you know, outlet boxes. My screwdriver slipped, touched the side of the box. Pow! Found out. Oh. Some places still have old metal boxes encased in there. Well, needless to say, we blew out a lot. I blew, we didn't, I did. We blew out a lot of circuits. I don't know how long it took and who was brave enough to try to figure out my mess. But it, it got done. And uh, a lot of hats. I want to speak to you tonight on this thought, the work of faith that's found in the life of Abraham. There's three definite, distinct hats, if you will, that Abraham wears in this portion of Scripture here in Genesis chapter number 18. That I think will help us to see how that faith was worked in his life. But before I read Genesis chapter 18, let me read a book found in the book of James. Excuse me, the book of Philippians. In Philippians chapter number 2, I believe it is, chapter 3, maybe chapter 4. This just came to my mind. That's why I'm kind of struggling right now. If I find this one, then I'll be able to go. Oh, 
Paul is writing, and he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Somebody help me with that verse. Work out your own salvation. It's right here. Oh, no wonder I can't find it. I'm in Galatians. It helps by Dr. Philippians, wouldn't it? 2.12. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians is capitula dos, versicula dosa. Wherefore, my beloved, beloved brethren, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Then he says, this would be good for every home. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. But verse number 12, he said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Can I tell you, the work of faith is an outworking of an inward work. Someone said, you get out of something what you put into it. In other words, you get out of church what you put in church. To give you a, a better example, if, if I could, if, how many of you have a savings account? It might be an IRA, it might be an annuity, but you've got savings account that draws interest. Okay. If you have a savings account or an IRA account or any kind of a, uh, an annuity or a mutual fund account that you are using for investment for your future, if you put nothing in, how much interest do you get? Don't get anything. But, I mean, if, it, if you put in $1,000 at a 6% interest, you're going to get $60 if my math is correct. Is that right? Somebody help me. $60 interest on $1,000 invested. You're getting something out of what you put in. The more you put in, the more you get out. So when Paul said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, he's, he's saying, look, you're going to have to do something on your part to get anything out of this Christian life. I think so many times we expect God to do it all. He's done everything he's required to do. In fact, he's not even really required to do this to save us by giving his son to die for us. He did that because he loves us, because he's merciful. But now Abraham, in Genesis chapter 18, we've seen his witness of faith. We've seen the working of faith in, in some other areas. We've seen the worrisome of faith. We've seen the weakness of faith. We saw this morning the worship of faith in Genesis chapter 22. So I'm backtracking now to chapter 18. But I want you to notice the work of faith. There's three distinct halves that show that Abraham has a faith that's inward, that's coming out, that's working in his life and through his life for the benefit of others. I want you to notice with me in this portion of Scripture, and instead of reading the chapter, I'm just going to just go through it with you tonight. In verse number 1, down through verse number 8, we see the first hat, if you will, that Abraham wears. And it is the ministry or the hat of a servant. The hat of a servant. He's a minister. Notice as it begins here in chapter uh, 18 in verse number 1. Immediately, and the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lift up his eyes, this is Abraham, and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, he's acknowledging that he's recognizing these men. I want you to notice, as a servant, the quickness of his ministry. The quickness of his ministry in verse 1 through 6. Abraham, when he sees and recognizes the Lord and the other two men with him, he responds with an immediate action. He springs to his feet and he runs. I want to ask you a question. When God moves in, how quick do we respond? How quick are we to minister unto him as a servant of the Lord Jesus? How quick are we? I, I, I always thought it was funny whenever I was uh, an assistant manager for Hardee's and 
and, and so forth, and you give instructions to the front. Everybody knows that uh, <coughs> notoriously in the afternoon, young people, when they're hired in, it, it's hard to get them motivated sometimes, you know, to serve customers or to do things that need to be done. And so uh, you sit back and you watch, and you find them just sitting around kind of talking to one another. Or we had a thing that if you got time to lean, you got time to clean, you know. In other words, if you got time to prop on the counter, you got time to wipe the counter, you know. Clean it up, clean the table, get the garbage out, things like that. But it's amazing how that when the owner of the store walks in, everybody jumps and runs. When the regional manager walks in a store to check out a store, if you will, and to inspect a store, immediately the managers, the crew people, everybody, er, nothing else, nothing else matters. We got to get on our P's and Q's. We got to make sure we got all of this done and all of this right. But the whole thing is, why haven't we been doing it before he got there? Amen. But then what I'm trying to say is, he had a quickness to his ministry. The Lord showed up, he recognized him, man, he jumped to his feet, he ran to meet him, and he became engaged in what his needs were. You know, when we're serving Christ, regardless of how menial the task, we should do our best to recognize who we're serving. If it's sweeping the force, we're serving Christ. If it's emptying the trash, we're serving Christ. If it's straightening the songbooks, we're serving Christ. If we're vacuuming the floor, it's serving Christ. If we're washing the windows, it's serving Christ. If we're cleaning the blinds, it's serving Christ. Whatever. If we're singing in the choir, we're serving Christ. If we're doing anything, it's all to be a service for Christ. The ministry of a servant or the hat of a servant. Notice, he's quick. You know, turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. And verse 23, hold your finger here. Go to Colossians. Colossensis, Epistle of the Trace, Versicle of the Bainted Trace. I think it's, it helps us to turn in the Word of God. And it helps us to read what God has to instruct us through the lives of others. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. There's a great principle here. If I, When I got saved as a 14-year-old, it, it made a difference in my schoolwork. I mean, I didn't like biology, but I passed biology with a B. That's better. B stands for better than C, which is cruddy, you know. And, you know, uh, it wasn't, out, it wasn't uh, amazing because I didn't get an A except an occasional quiz. But what I'm saying is where before it was kind of, eh, I didn't like dissecting. I just didn't. I don't like smelling the formaldehyde coming out of the jar. Yeah. Lay the frog down and pin him down and pin his legs down. Helpless creature, he's already dead. Sticking more pins in him. I didn't like it. You take, you take that little razor blade, you, you know, peel him back. You sort of, you know, I, I, I'm, I didn't like it. But when I got saved, my whole perspective of learning, because now... I am to be a student. I'm here to learn. I'm here to give my best because of Christ. As a student, when I got to college, I had psychology. I still haven't figured out what I am. You know, Dr. White, bless his heart there at Temple. I mean, my goodness. I can still see him now. You're never going to make it, Simon. You know, psychoanalysis, man, I broke the mold when it came to that. They're still guessing. You know, trying to figure out the mind of a man. When many people think he came from a monkey, you know. What I'm, I'm talking about, 
I did my I did my grade. I passed the course. I passed the course. I'm not gonna tell you what I passed it with, but I passed it. I got the grade. But can I tell you? It was a struggle for me, but I wanted to do my best. My best was not what I had been doing and everything else, because this was a whole different ball game. But can I tell you as a student? And when I got to college, it became different. When I got on the job, I wanted to please Christ. It wasn't my boss. Carl Lovitzen, bless his heart, I remember when, he, when I hired in at St. Regis Paper Company. Carl Lovitzen, big old heavyset guy. And bless his heart, he was Catholic to the core. I tried to win him to Christ. I tried to tell him about Jesus, but he died with a heart attack on the interstate highway, pulled off his car just in time. Sat there and died with a heart attack. Went out into eternity without God. But he would listen. But I wanted to be the best box stripper that they had. And that was a little fellow like me with a 25-pound jackhammer stripping off the waist off of folding carton boxes that were taller than I was. But I wanted to be the best. I wanted to do my best for Christ. I wanted there to be no reproach as a Christian. Can I tell you, working out my salvation when the boss came, I didn't want him to find me doing nothing. I wanted him to find me doing something. And when he came, I wanted to respond and be ready to serve and do what he asked of me. As an employee on the job, the quickness of his ministry, if it's worth doing for the Lord, someone said, it is worth doing, say it with me, right or well, either one works. I want you to notice the quality of his ministry, not just the quickness, but the quality of his ministry is found in verse 7 and 8. And I, I mean, I could go on and read more verses here about the quickness. of it. He said, let a little water, I pray you, verse 4, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort your hearts after that you shall pass on. For therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened. I mean, he, I mean, he jumped to it. And he went to the tent unto Sarah and said, Make qu- ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the earth. But then the quality, notice, he then in verse 7 and 8, And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them and he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. Now I want you to notice, he didn't just give them the morsel of bread that he got got from Sarah to eat. He decided he's going to go further. And he went to his flock and he pulled out a lamb, the best of his flock, gave it to a young man who dressed it, killed it, dressed it, and they prepared it and he set it before them. Hey, the quality of his service is he gave his best. He gave the best that he had. You know, when I think about Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He said, present yourself. Present yourself. The best that you and I have to offer Christ is our life. Our life. When God gets all of our life, he gets all that we have whether it be our finances, whether it be our physical bodies and and abilities, whether it be our minds and thinking, whatever it might be, God gets it. All to give Him the very best. Notice the quietness of His ministry in the last part of verse number 8. And here's, Here's something I really like. And He said it before them, and He stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. I want you to notice he set the table, he prepared, had everything fixed, he put it on the table, and then he stepped back out of the way. But he stood at the ready while they ate. He didn't sit around with them and talk. He didn't sit around and eat with them. It was not a time for fellowship. It was a time for service. A time for service. Our life should always be when we serve Christ, we step back and be ready for the next opportunity. To serve Christ. To serve Christ. He quietly stood back under the tree and they did eat. I want you to notice that's his ministry, his hat of a servant. I want to ask you, do you wear a hat of a servant like Abraham? 
I mean, is the faith of trusting Christ as your Savior, is that faith working out in your life to where you're quick to minister to Him? Where the quality of your ministry is you're giving your best and the quietness where you're waiting for the next opportunity to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Notice with me secondly, I want you to notice the second ministry that He had. And if you will, it is that of a saint. Notice with me in verse 9 down through verse 21 the message for a saint. And as they said unto him, and they said unto him in verse 9, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of, of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. And now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. In other words, she's beyond childbearing. She's beyond the ability to bring life into this world. She's not able any longer. Therefore, verse 12, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being also old? In other words, I can I, can I have a moment with you? I can hear her now. She's laughing. I'm old. I can't do this. And Abraham's even older than I am. What do you think we're going to do besides sit in a rocking chair and get old together? You know? The time is past for bringing children in this world. Some of you get that. I, can, I mean, my mind runs with me. I put it in the reality. I can just hear it. I can, you know, but I want you to notice God is sending a message here about a child. And he says, you're gonna, I'm going to come to you at the time appointed. And she's laughing. The Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Then verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not. But she said here, for she was afraid. And he said, nay, but thou didst laugh. Don't you understand, God always knows our hearts. God always knows the truth. We try to brush it off. I, you know, I was just joking. And a lot of times we say things in joking that we mean with serious intent. God knows the difference. God knows the difference. But that message, hey, I'm going, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you. God had promised him a son way back. And he's reminding him again of his promise. We'll find, you'll find as you get over to chapter number 21, I believe it is. 20. 20. There's a son. There's a son that's born. Isaac, the promised seed. But then I notice not only do we have a message for a saint about a child, but it's about a city. A city called Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at verse 16. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him. I like that statement. For I know him. That he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken unto him. Let me just stop right there for a moment. How well does God know you? How well does God know you? As a parent like Abraham, does God know you well enough to know that your children are going to follow you and they're going, to, they're going to also grow up to know God and live for God and do righteously and justly? 
Do the, I, he said, I know Abraham that he will command. He will order. He will direct his family to live right. Hey, we live in a day today when children of parents no longer care for the house of God because parents did not make church a priority. Hello. Some are here tonight. Some are not here tonight. Why? Because some are teaching their children that, hey, church is not a priority. I don't understand everything that's going on. doesn't matter. Church is where we're supposed to be. Hello? Family's supposed to be in church. Family's supposed to be in church. I'm glad my family's in church with me tonight. I'm glad that my daughter and son-in-law and grandchildren are in church tonight. They were taught. They were instructed. They may not be in church with me, but they're in church where they belong. They're serving God where they belong. Can I tell you, families ought to be raised to do right for God. How does God know you? Great responsibility back there, Eddie, with that little baby. Train him right. The house of God. To love the things of God, the word of God. The people of God. Parents don't care anymore. They would more rather their kids know more about Miley Cyrus and Justin Bieber than all the rest of the people in the world. Can I tell you? I, I, and this is being live streamed on TV, on, on, on computer, by the way. So I'm going on documented record. We don't need Justin Bieber in Buckhead. There's enough trash and enough filth in Atlanta already. We don't need any more. And the reason it's here is because God's people have vacated and abdicated their role and their responsibility in bringing up their homes. And their families right. your kids know more about the pop music culture than they do about the word of God, you haven't done your job as a parent. Hello. Training them in the word of God and the things of God is our responsibility as a Christian. I, please, please understand. I'm fixing to get to the real reason why we have where, where, where we are. And what it's going to lead up to. When he get to this message about this city, he said, I, I, do I tell Abraham? Do I tell him what I'm fixing to do? He's got family in that city. He's got friends in that city. Do I tell him what I'm fixing to do to Sodom and Gomorrah? The Lord said, verse 20, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grievous. I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. I want you to notice here, I want you to notice what's, what's taking place. He said, there's a cry that's coming up out of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And there's a cry of wickedness. And, and there's a cry of hatred. It's a cry of wickedness. And God cannot look upon wickedness. God cannot smile upon sin. He said, I'm going to go down there. And I'm going to look. And I'm going to listen. He said, whatever they can, I'll know. Notice what he said, I'll know whether it's so. Ah. Can, you, can you fathom what the context is here? He's just been with Abraham, the friend of God. He's just been with Abraham, the man that he's going to bring a son to his life that will be a father of all nations. Multitudes will be blessed because of this, because of his faith. but he's leaving Abraham. It's like leaving your house. He said, I'm going down the street. I'm going into the heart of the problem. 
I'm going to check it out. It's a sad day in Atlanta when a church that used to be a fundamental Baptist church in downtown Atlanta is nothing but a nightclub any longer. A place where revivals were, a place where the preaching was, a place where souls were saved, but now it's a place of debauchery, of sin. Told about the tabernacle downtown Atlanta. I mean, a place where the platform used to be a pulpit. Now it's a playground for the devil and his crowd. God said, I'm going down from where you live. I'm checking it out. He said, I'll know. I'll know. Never feel as though the relationship you have with Christ as his friend is only for super saints. You can be a friend of God. You can have an impact with God. You can have an impact for, for Christ in this community and in Atlanta. But I find something very interesting as he tells him where he's going and what he's fixing to do. I see the mediation of a son, the third half, beginning in verse 22 on, in verse 23. Basically, this actually 22 down through the end of the chapter, verse 33. It said, And the men turned their faces from thence. In other words, they turned their face and back toward Abraham, from Abraham, and went to Sodom. Verse 22, and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. We need some Abrahams that will stand in the gap. We need some Abrahams that will stand yet before the Lord. Why is University Baptist Church still in Atlanta? Because there needs to be a lighthouse yet before the Lord inside 285. There needs to be a place that's holding high cross. It's lifting up the word of God. When I look at this, he stands before the Lord. Notice what it says in verse 23. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? I want you to notice this. Abraham draws near. He said, are you going to destroy the righteous along with the wicked? Are you going to destroy all those that may be of my family as well? Are you going to judge, the, pour out your judgment upon all of them as you are upon the wicked sinners? Is that what you're fixing to do? Stand right here with me. Notice the text. Follow with me. He said, Per adventure, there be 50. 50. Espanol? Say again. 50. How much? What is that in English? Oh, he's good. He's good. He's good. She's doing well. Fifty. Per adventure there be fifty. Righteous with the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? He's looking at the Lord. He's standing face to face. He's near. He's close. For fifty. I can I can I don't know about you, but again, let me let me Will you save them for 50? Would you save them for 50? He's pleading. Notice as he goes further. He says, That be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked, verse 25. And the right and that the righteous should not be should be as the wicked, that be fa that be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? In other words, aren't you going to do right? For 50, won't you do right? Notice what 
Jesus says. Notice what the Lord says. And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the plagues for their sakes. Just 50. How many we have here tonight? Brother Victor, count that side. Brother Dan, count this side. Quickly. Give me a toll. There's three in the sound room. Right? Three? I can't see. Three. Okay. That didn't help. How many is in, anybody in the nursery? How many do you have? 19? 18? 37? And three? Does that count to three? That's 40. And we've got, okay, Rolito's back there on, all right, 41. We don't even have 50. But watch. Watch. Notice he goes further. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust. I'm just flesh. I'm just dust and ashes, but I'm speaking to the Lord. And he says, Peradventure there shall be, there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, this is the Lord. If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. We still don't have forty-five here. For God to spare judgment upon Atlanta. But let's read further. He said, and he spake unto him, verse 29, and said, peradventure there be forty found there and he said I will not do it for 40's sake that's 40 righteous that's 40 who are saved by God's grace can I can I, can I put such, that little one back there has not the knowledge of accountability before God he's righteous in God's eyes but there are others I wonder, that causes us to search our heart and know for sure that we're saved. Because the judgment of Atlanta to be spared, according to this, requires every one of the 40 to be saved. Does it not? Young people, boys back there who are talking with your heads bowed down, hey, it's respons your responsibility to know and make sure that you're saved or people are going to die because of your unsaved unrighteousness it's your responsibility he didn't put an age qualification on this did he for 40 but out of 41 I'm convinced not everyone's saved just because you say you're a Christian just because you say you're saved I did that too until one night God got a hold of my heart and I realized I was lost on my way to hell. Mom and daddy couldn't make the difference. Preacher couldn't make the difference. Church couldn't make the difference. It was Christ and Christ alone who could make the difference. Notice he went further and he said, and said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. In other words, don't get angry with me. I'm pleading with you. I'm in mediation with you as a son to a father. Don't judge them. And he says in verse number 30, Peradventure there shall 30 be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure, notice verse 31. He said, Peradventure there shall be 20 found there. Notice he's gone from increments of 5. Now he's in increments of 10, gone from 40 to 30. To 20. But there be 20. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. I will speak, but yet this once, just one more time. Peradventure, 10 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. 10. Did you get this? Remember, God said, I know Abraham. I know that he will command his children to follow right, to live right, 
to be right, to be saved. I know Abraham, but I'm going there and I'll know if there's ten. Abraham thought he knew. For ten. Abraham thought he knew. There's Lot. There's Mrs. Lot. There's two daughters that are not married in the city. You read the next chapter. There are, there is a daughter who's married that's there. How many is that? Mama, daddy, two daughters are married. Daughter, there's two daughters that were married. So, so there we've told us about eight people. If just those eight people, if Lot had reached just two, just think two, beyond his family, there would be ten. Had he been the soul winner he's supposed to be, had been a witness like he's supposed to be, had he been faithful to God like he's supposed to be, surely he would have had his family and two more. Could have been two servants. He had the influence. Peradventure, ten. But notice the last verse. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communion with Abraham. And Abraham returned into his place. Abraham had been standing before the Lord. He had standing in the gap. He said, would you find 50? Would you spare him? 45, would you spare it? 40, would you spare it? I'm talking about an intercessor. As a son, a mediator, as a son with a father. When's the last time you and I got so burdened for somebody, some people, that we just pled with God and pled with God and pled with God and pled with God that you'd save them. Don't judge them. Don't destroy them for their wickedness. Don't destroy the right... And then did everything we could to win as many as we were asking God to save it for. I think if we had the same passion, wore the same hat as Abraham did, because of a work of faith, we might see a revival. We might see a staying of the hand of God. I'm reminded... The Lord Jesus Christ hung upon the cross. The very first words that he uttered from the cross was, Father, forgive them. There's the mediation of a son. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Stay. I'm told that the, in context, the same idea in phraseology is the same as it was with Joshua in the day of battle when he asked that God would let the sun stand still until they defeated the enemy at the end of the day. And God let the sun stand in the sky for a period of 24 hours that they might win the victory. Has God changed since Joshua was there? Has God changed since Abraham's day. Has God changed since Christ hung on the cross? Or have we changed? Have we changed? Oh, as a servant, he was quick. His service was with quality and quietness. He didn't seek attention. He just sought to serve. That of a saint... He could receive the message about his son. He could receive the message about his city. But yet as a, as a son, he intervened. He got between God and Sodom and pled with God for just ten righteous souls. If every person would pray and try to reach one soul of man just one we'd see a revolution back to righteousness we begin to see a change in our community all over again 
I don't know about you, but it's wonderful to be saved. It's wonderful to put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But I need to work out my salvation. It needs to work out through my, the work of faith in my life. Father, cause me to be the right servant, right saint, and a right son for others. Let's pray in worship. If there's anything you need, take away from this tonight, it's this. You and I need a close personal relationship with God because without it, it's impossible for anyone, anyone to be the servant the saint or the son that God wants him to be. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Would you let God have his way tonight?